This is the lecture video for Chapter 10, Reactions of Alcohols, Ethers, Epoxides, Amines, and some Sulfur-Containing Compounds. Note that we are going to be skipping Section 10.8 in this chapter because it requires some information from Chapter 8, which we skipped. Organic chemical reactions can be categorized into four different groups. The first group here is nucleophiles. Those are my alkenes, my alkynes, and my dienes. We discussed those in chapters 5 through 7, and they underwent electrophilic addition reactions. So these are nucleophiles, they add electrophiles. Group 2, a subject we're going to be talking about here in chapter 10, these are all electrophiles. Okay? We have alkyl halides. We have alcohols, we have ethers, we have epoxides, which is just sort of another ether, but it's in a three-membered ring. We have sulfates, and we have nitrogen-containing compounds. These are all electrophiles. Okay? Also notice that these undergo nucleophilic substitution, which we talked about in Chapter 9 for alkyl halides. In this chapter, chapter 10, we're going to be talking about how we create alkyl halides from alcohols. What kind of reactions do ethers and epoxides and sulfur and nitrogen containing compounds undergo? There are two more groups that our text author Bruce likes to categorize organic reactions in. Those are electrophiles, which are going to be our carboxylic acids our esters, our ketones, and aldehydes. We'll talk more about those in chapters 15 and 17 next semester, and also about aromatic electrophilic and nucleophilic reactions in chapter 18. So in chapter 9, we talked about nucleophilic substitution and elimination reactions using alkyl halides. In chapter 10, we're going to do much the same thing. We're going to talk about chemical reactions that are mostly substitution and elimination reactions of alcohols and ethers and epoxides, some amines and some sulfur-containing compounds. So let's first start talking about oxygen-containing compounds, our alcohols and our ethers and epoxides. Oxygen typically has two lone pairs of electrons, which we can see both in the Bohr model of an atom. Here's my two lone pairs that are paired up. We can also see that in an energy diagram, again, based on the Bohr model, where we have two orbitals that have a pair of electrons in the outermost shell, the two shell, and two unpaired. It's these unpaired that will form our bonding. We could either form two single bonds or one double bond because we'd like to have eight electrons in our outermost shell. I go over here to column six in our periodic table. That tells me that I have six electrons in my outermost valence shell. In order to fill that outermost shell with eight electrons, I'm going to either form two single bonds or one double bond to get eight electrons around oxygen. My two single bonds are typical for either alcohols, ethers, or epoxies. My double bonds are my ketones, aldehydes, carboxylic acids, etc. My esters and acid chlorides and those we're going to talk about in chapters 15 and 17 next semester. So let's look at reactions of alcohols to form alkyl halides. We know if we can do, make alkyl halides, we can do a lot of chemical reactions. So let's see how alcohols can be transformed into alkyl And that's just a substitution reaction again. However, the hydroxy group is such a poor leaving group, we first need to activate it and make it into a good leaving group. One way to do that is to put in some acid. 
which protonates that alcohol, making this whole group a good leaving group, because once it leaves, it's just water. And then it can be attacked by a good nucleophile. If we have an alkyl halide that's both an acid and a nucleophile, we can perform this reaction with just one chemical reagent. In other words, using molecules like HBr, which is acidic and a nucleophile, or HI, which is acidic and it is a nucleophile. These will undergo SN1 or SN2 reactions. Let's look at the mechanism for that. Here I have one butanol, that is a primary alcohol, so I think that's going to go undergo substitution via SN2 because it's primary. I'm first going to protonate my oxygen using my HBr, releasing my bromide ion. I've made the H2O plus a good leaving group. Now my bromine come in, can come in from the backside, attack that carbon, and kick off my water to form one bromobutane with the opposite stereochemistry, Walden inversion. Tertiary alcohols cannot react via SN2 because it's too hindered for attack, but they can undergo SN1 reactions. So here I have a tertiary alcohol, T-butyl alcohol. The first step is similar to that of SN2. I want to make the OH, my hydroxyl group, a good leaving group. It gets protonated by my acid. I then, because it's a tertiary alcohol, my water can leave and form a stable carbocation, which then can be attacked by my nucleophile, my bromine anion in solution, to form T-butyl bromide. Secondary alcohols would prefer to undergo substitution by an SN1 mechanism. However, because a carbocation is formed as an intermediate, if I can rearrange to form a nor more stable carbocation, we will. So here is an example of that. Here I have a secondary alcohol. I put it in with some HBr. I protonate my hydroxyl group. It becomes a good leaving group. So I form a cation. And this is a secondary cation. Notice there's a hydrogen right next to it here that if I did a hydride shift, a 1,2 hydride shift, I'd form a more stable tertiary carbocation. So that is the preferred mechanism for this. And then it gets attacked by my bromine anion to form 2-bromo-2-methylbutane. Not all of the secondary carbocation will arrange. It depends on the time and the energy in the solution. Some of that will react to form 2-bromo-3-methylbutane, and that is a minor product. Bromine is a good nucleophile if it is in a protic solvent. Again, we're stabilizing the anion so they can react and stabilizing the carbocation. Let's look at the following reactions, and let's determine whether these reactions will undergo substitution preferentially by SN2 or SN1. If I look at this first example, I have a primary alcohol here. I have a halogenated acid, so I'm going to protonate my hydroxyl group, and then my iodine can come back in and attack that carbon that the hydroxyl group is attached to to form the 1-iodo propane. So this is going to be an SN2 reaction. Primary alcohols undergo substitution by SN2. In the second example, I have cyclohexanol. I also have a HBr acid. I would protonate that hydroxyl group for secondary alcohols this is going to proceed via SN1. And if I look at this, if I formed a carbocation at this carbon right here, 
and I have no opportunities for hydride shifts or methyl shifts to make a more stable carbocation, so I get one product preferentially, and this will undergo reaction by SN1. The third example here is a tertiary alcohol. We know those highly favor SN1 reactions. So protonate the alcohol, the hydroxyl group with HBr, form my carbocation, look for rearrangements. I already have the most stable one. This is an SN1 substitution reaction to turn a tertiary alcohol into a tertiary alkyl halide. Let's propose a mechanism that accounts for the product shown. So here I have a secondary alcohol. I notice that my hydroxy group is on one, two, on the second carbon next to the aromatic ring. In my product, I have the bromine is on the first carbon next to the aromatic ring. So I'm suspecting a rearrangement has occurred, which would to me mean that I'm proceeding via an SN1 reaction. The first thing that will happen is I'll protonate my hydroxy group to make it a good leaving group. That will leave to form a carbocation. Now that carbocation, if it can rearrange to form a more stable carbocation, it will. I look next to it for possibilities. There's two hydrogens right next to it. And if I did a 1-2 hydride shift, I'm going to form a benzylic carbocation, which is more stable than a secondary carbocation. So that occurs. And then finally, my bromine anion will attack my carbocation to form my product. Notice I've drawn a sort of a squiggly line here, implying that I have a racemic mixture. I have both an R and an S stereoisomer. That's because in all carbocation reactions, I can attack from either side to form the stereoisomers. So this is an SN1 reaction. Some of the drawbacks of SN1 reaction is that actually elimination will compete with substitution. So I probably get some elimination products with a double bond here. As we see in this example, I have rearrangements that occur and also I get poor yields of alkyl halides that have involved chlorine. So far, we've only talked about HBr and HI. We haven't talked about HCl because HCl does not do very well in substitution reactions for primary and secondary alcohols. There are several other methods used to convert alcohols to alkyl halides, and specifically, these are used to form the chlorine-based alkyl halide. An example of that is if I take a primary alcohol and add HCl, that reaction alone goes very slowly with poor yields. But I add zinc chloride to the solution, which is a Lewis acid, it catalyzes this reaction to form the primary alkyl halide. So zinc chloride and HCl promote substitution with chlorine. I can also use phosphorus as a Lewis acid. In this case, I'm using phosphorus tribromide in the presence of a primary alcohol. I've added pyridine as my solvent, which also acts as a base to form the bromine alkyl halide. I can do the same thing with phosphorus trichloride and get very good yields of the primary alkyl halide. And third, I can use this thionyl chloride reagent to form the chlorine-based alkyl halide. Again, I'm using pyridine as a solvent in these last three cases. Let's now look at some of these in a little more detail. So let's first look at the zinc chloride HCl, primary alcohol with HCl. I need this Lewis acid catalyst to help the reaction to form the alkyl halide with chlorine. The mechanism is here I have my hydroxy group with lone pairs of electrons. Those act as a nucleophile in this case. 
they attack my Lewis acid because this wants electrons. When it does that, it kicks off my chlorine. I now have this complex, which makes this whole group here a very good leaving group. Chlorine comes back in, and my zinc chloride hydroxy complex leaves. That's the mechanism for using HCl and zinc chloride to do substitution reactions on alcohols. What about the reaction rates of the zinc chloride HCl method for creating the alkyl halide? For secondary alcohols, the reaction is an SN1 mechanism, and that tends to be fairly fast. So again, I form the complex between the zinc and my oxygen. I have this complex, which now makes this whole group here in green a good leaving group. I form the carbocation, I'm attacked by chloride to form my alkyl halide. Notice here that this leaving group here is actually insoluble once it leaves, so it precipitates out as a whitish yellow powder. If I have a primary alcohol, this zinc chloride has to undergo the reaction by an SN2 mechanism, and this is very, very slow. Okay, So this complex does not happen very fastly because it does not go via an SN1. It proceeds via SN2. So this is a slow reaction. When it does occur, and very slowly, it also precipitates out my zinc chloride hydroxy complex precipitates out a solution. Scientists have used this difference in rates of reaction as a methodology for testing for primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols. So if I add zinc chloride and HCl to an alcohol, my zinc chloride bonds very strongly to the hydroxyl group, and my zinc chloride hydroxide complex here is insoluble, so it precipitates out. And if I look at the reaction rates, primary alcohols react very slowly. That's because they have to proceed by SN2 mechanism, which is very slow. Secondary alcohols will proceed via an SN1 mechanism, but the resulting carbocation intermediate is not as stable, so it's higher energy, so it's a slow reaction. Tertiary alcohols t tend to react very fast with zinc chloride, so it's a very fast reaction. And all we're looking for is this white precipitate and how long it took to form that white precipitate. This test is known as the Lucas test. So I can differentiate between primary, secondary, and tertiary alcohols depending on how fast they react and form this white precipitate. Now let's look at the reaction mechanism for these phosphorus halides. And let's first take a look at a generic reaction here. Here I have an alcohol, and I have three equivalents here, because in my phosphorus trihalide, I have three equivalents of the halide. So one mole of phosphorus halide will react with three moles of my alcohol to form three moles of my alkyl halide. The mechanism is similar to that of zinc chloride. I have my nucleophilic lone pair of electrons on my oxygen of my alcohol. It attacks my phosphorus, which is a good electrophile. Bromine is kicked off. I then have made this a good leaving group. Pyridine comes in and as a, acts as a base to deprotonate that phosphorus hydroxy complex here. And then my bromine comes in and it attacks my carbon and my bromophosphite act group actually leaves. So if I want to form alkyl halides with bromine, I use phosphorus tribromide. If I want to form 
alkyl halides with chlorines, I use phosphorus trichloride. If I want to form alkyl halides with iodine, I can't use phosphorus triiodide because it's not stable, but I can make it in situ, meaning I can put phosphorus and iodine into a solution, and an intermediate is phosphorus triiodide, which then reacts in the same mechanism as the phosphorus tribromide and the phosphorus trichloride. There is another chemical reaction which is actually much better for making alkyl halides with chlorine, and that uses thionyl chloride as a reagent. So I take an alcohol, I take thionyl chloride, my sulfur here is a good electrophile, and I form the alkyl halide with chlorine. Similar mechanism, I have my lone pair of electrons, nucleophilic, attacking my electrophilic sulfur, kick off the chlorine. Pyridine comes in, pulls off that hydrogen. The chlorine ion attacks my carbon, and that whole big chloral sulfate group is my leaving group to form the alkyl halide with chlorine. In fact, this is actually a more preferred method for making it if you want high yields. However, because you produce these sulfates and sulfites, it can be quite stinky because sulfur compounds do have an aroma to them. Let's review some of these chemical reactions for converting alcohols into alkyl halides. If I want the alkyl halide with bromide, one easy method is to react the alcohol with HBr. That's going to do a substitution reaction. Depending on whether I'm a primary alcohol, I will undergo reaction by SN2. If I'm a secondary or tertiary alcohol, my reaction will proceed via SN1. If I want to form the alkyl halide with iodine, I can use just HI in presence of my alcohol, and I get good yields. HI is a good protonating agent and iodide is a good nucleophile. If I want to form the alkyl halide with chlorine, I need to add a catalyst to my solution, in this case a Lewis acid, zinc chloride, to promote the reaction to form the alkyl halide with chlorine. I can also form the alkyl halides using phosphorus tribromide or phosphorus trichloride, I get good yields of the alkyl halides here. Again, using pyridine as my solvent, and also it acts as a base to deprotonate my complex. One methodology for, form, for creating alkyl halides with chlorine is to react my alcohol with ionyl chloride to form the chlorinated alkyl halide. So why convert an alcohol into an alkyl halide? Well, alcohols are actually readily available, but they're typically not as reactive as alkyl halides, so I am limited in what type of reactions I can perform. So what I do is if I can take my alcohol, convert it into alkyl halide, that opens up all kinds of other chemical reactions to replace this hydroxyl group with a halogen, I can then replace that halogen with an alkoxide to form an ether, or I could attack that alkyl halide with a acetylide to form an alkyne, or I could use some other type of nucleophile to attack that alkyl halide. In this case, I'm forming a nitrile using the cyanide anion. Very versatile chemical reaction, converting alcohols into alkyl halides, and then doing another series of reactions.